Happy fucking New Year. Ah, uh, fooled you again. <laughs> you downloaded it and you were like, oh, Kevin Pollock's chat show is back for uh, 2017. No, it's still me. You're stuck with me, but only for one more week. I promise. Kevin will be back next week. No, I don't. I think it's Jay Moore next week. Say what? I think it's Jay Moore next week. God damn it. Why am I always the last to know these things? Seriously? Yeah, seriously. I mute you, Jamie. Oh. Oh. Anyway, apparently it's going to be Jay Moore next week. I still won't be here. I'll be uh, up in San Francisco doing comedy. So, hey, if you're going to be in the San Francisco area, come see me doing comedy. Links on my Twitter. Um, but uh, the point is, Kevin, we don't know where Kevin is. We're all worried about him. We haven't seen him since last year. Um, we got a, a piece of clothing in the mail that we think is his. Uh, it smelled of rich Italian leather. It was actually just his jacket from End of Days. <laughs> it was his jacket from End of Days. Joe has now, our friend Joe has now uh, acquired Kevin's jacket from End of Days and has been flaunting it around the house. Yes. Um, well, anyway, the bottom line is this. You're stuck with me for the next 90 minutes or so. Proceed at your own risk, fans of this podcast. Uh, Jamie, how are you? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. Everything's yeah. good. Yeah, I had, I don't know if I shared this last time, but I like, I had a pretty good 2016 if you take away like outside issues. <laughs> <laughs> like per, like if you like personally, like yeah. I, like like growth, growth and development for myself, good good year. Good year. 2016. You know what? I think that's the way to look at it. Yeah. Uh, everyone else I know had miserable years. Um, but I think a lot of that has to do with. With outside influence. Outside issues, yeah. which were not good. Yeah. We cannot control the universe. Nope. So there you go. Not I mean, yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, I want to apologize uh, to those listening. I may clear my throat once or twice today. I'm not sick sick. It's just plague. <laughs> oh, boy. No, the doctor said that was curable. Two, two cycles I got a jar of leeches here. We're Cipro good to go. <laughs> we're going to do a bloodletting at the halfway point in the show. I'll be fine. <clears throat> You'll never see me again. This is my last broadcast. Um, well, I guess uh, I feel like there's no other new business to cover. Um, so I'm going to get right down to it because 2017, y'all. Maybe that's what I do this year. I say y'all more. No. No. Doesn't feel right. Does not feel right. It doesn't feel coming out of you. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Hey. If you're under 40 and owned a television at some point, today's guest is someone you probably feel like you grew up with. But if you're over 40 and never owned a television, you must be my mother. <laughs> Regardless, both young and old have no doubt come across my guest at various points in his career. Whether you know him as the lovable bad boy next door, or the poor guy trying to outrun a flesh-eating virus, or maybe even the recent college graduate trying to fend off the advances of Mrs. Robinson, his is a face you just don't forget. Yes, he may be Sean Hunter to you, but to me, he'll always be the only actor I ever wet myself for. Please welcome to the show, Ryder Strong. Thank you. Hey. Are you going to explain the wet yourself for? In uh, time. Okay, okay, we'll get there. We'll get in there. In time. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to bring that up or if we just uh, Oh, no, we have to bring it, it up. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we can't not talk about that. Was that the first time that we met? Or no, no I actually the, met you before that, We right? had met, I was telling uh, J-Mac, our esteemed producer, the first time you and I met, I think we were both testing. Oh, that's right. For Kid Mayor. Kid Mayor. Which you did, right? Which I wound up doing. And the craziest thing about that, uh, uh, since I already mentioned Mrs. Robinson, was that both you and John Laval and Ben Feldman, all three guys testing for the lead, had played, had all played Ben. ben. Yeah, at so some weird. various iteration it's of so the show. So weird. Yeah, um, yeah. We we had all auditioned on Broadway and mm -hmm. gotten to know each other because we were all in the mix. I think John was the only one who had actually done the show on Broadway. This is the Graduate, the play version of the Graduate. Yeah. Um, John ended up doing it on, on Broadway, okay. um, and Ben was his understudy. Oh, that's what it was. And then okay. I did the national tour. Right. So um, yeah, and then all three of us were up for the same. It was obviously <laughs> they wanted the same type <laughs> in both. But that's just the way Hollywood works too. Yeah. It's like, wait, that guy? He's kind of like this other guy. Like, yeah. oh, we, they wanted for that role, and it's like that's why you know in. Invariably, if you were like up for a job, especially as a kid, because the competition was so, you know, there's just less people up for yeah. a job. I remember I would test for like 
three shows in one pilot season, like all in you know, different networks, and they right. would just they would test you because they found out somebody else was testing. You know, right? It was and like, you'd always be testing against the same three or four same actors. Three or four, right. But we were never in competition. No, with each other. we were always the good kicks. looks of a handsome leading man, <laughs> and I am uh, Chuckle Buddy number three over here. Yeah, but then I made the transition to Chuckle Buddy number three, uh -huh. and uh, still kept getting put up for the leading man roles. And I was like, I'm not the guy. Like, stop putting me in these leading man it's roles. Not but, what the research indicates. Nah. If yeah. Julie Andrews is to be, <laughs> I, I, wow. I, I I gotta say, <laughs> we did, there are some plenty deep cuts here. Yeah. I, I do, uh, with a major hand from uh, Jason McIntyre, our producer, uh, there is, we spare no expense with the research mm. on this show. And uh, sometimes Not when I'm- Not unlike John Hammond. <laughs> and sometimes when I am doing research on a, on a program, or on a program, on a particular guest, I'm sitting through and I'm like, all right, I get it. I will talk about that. That's an interesting thing, everyone. There's so much I didn't know about you that I am so fucking fascinated All about. right. <laughs> um, and so paramount among them. Yeah. For all the crap you have been uh, given over your name over the years. Yeah. Ryder Strong, as you always say, that your parents gave you the perfect porno name. Yeah. Your father's name. Yes. His birth name pretty insane. Please share with the uh, crowd. King Arthur Strong. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, King Arthur Strong. Yeah. And that was apparently a coincidence in the sense that Arthur was going to be his, because that was his mother's maiden name, so that was going to be his middle name. Okay. And I think they had some distant family friend with the first name King, and they loved that. Wow. So yeah, in 1944, my dad was <laughs> named King Arthur Strong, and you know, he, Luckily, is a, a big guy, uh -huh. and he was a Marine and a firefighter. Okay. So people didn't really make fun of his name right. that much. It was sort of like <laughs> off limits. And you know, growing up, he like he really did. If 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 like another firefighter made a joke and called him Queen, like that was yeah. like whoa. Whoa. Um, I think yeah, you know, in 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 an age less homophobic, it's probably uh -huh. not as big of a deal now. But yeah. when he was you know in the 70s and 80s, it was like you know don't call him Queen. Oh boy. Um, but yeah, no, uh, so he always had an unusual name. When my parents first met, my mom didn't believe that that was his name. I still don't. So she made him show her, him, she made him show her his driver's license and that was the whole like, yeah. you know, the first date. That was their, their meet cute. That was um, their meet cute. Yeah. I don't believe you, I need proof. Exactly. Show me your papers. Show me your, right. And so, you know, they, they dated for six years, got married, and then when they decided to have kids, it was like, my mom said, I want them to have unusual names. Um, so they named my brother Shiloh, he mm -hmm. was the firstborn. Uh, Shiloh King Strong, and then I came out, and I was Ryder King Strong. And the, the, the irony is, if I was a woman, they would have named me Sierra, mm -hmm. Sierra Strong. And my dad, at the time, said, sounds kind of like a stripper name. But he didn't make the connection of Ryder Strong. Ryder Strong. Like, and I didn't either until I was 15. And I was staying at the Oakwood Apartments, which you must know, like every everybody that came to LA to start acting, especially as a kid, lived at the Oakwood Apartments with their parents, mm -hmm. the month-to-month -month apartment rentals. And we were gathered around the pool with a bunch of other kid actors. And I said, my name is Ryder. And someone asked me my last name, Ryder Strong. And this girl just looked at me and said, Ride Her Strong, mm -hmm. really? And I was like, ding, oh, I never, it never occurred to me. And wow. right around the same what time was when the movie Boogie Nights came out. Okay. And that didn't help things. No. Because that made like the whole concept of giving yourself a porno name or like renaming yourself to be in porn, right. that made it sort of mainstream. I think before then it wasn't like, you know, normal dinner conversation. But after that it was like, this is a funny, you know, parlor game. What's your porno name? It's just like, yeah. I just have one. Wow. It's just there. It's just, yeah, no work necessary. <laughs> and adding King doesn't really help. I mean, it breaks up the right her strong, but it still sounds like a, you know, fantasy character name or something. Oh, I guess you're right. I, uh, I've had people ask me over the years if I changed my name to be in show business and with the exception of Sam with two M's. Yeah. And I'm like, you think I changed it to Levine? There's a lot of Levines in the you industry. You wanted me right? to be more Jewy? <laughs> But why are there two M's at Sam? Is there an explanation? Yeah, there's another Sam, Sam with one M. He's like a hundred year old man, so I couldn't get like Sam with one M. Oh, and I had gotcha. gone in a previous life when I was really young as a fuck you to a teacher, I went by Sam with two M's. Uh, because she was like, no, that's, because I was Sammy. And then she said, uh, do you want to be Sammy? Why don't you write Sam on your next uh, test? And, and I wrote down S-A-M-M, -M, just drop the Y. She was like, no, that's not how you spell it. I was like, it's my name. I'll spell it any way I want. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I 
So I, uh, I often get asked if my name, my name's Jamie Foxx, and everyone's like, is that real? And I'm like, yeah. yes, it's not his real name. That's right. I'm like, it was my real name, Eric <laughs> Bishop, but not uh, his. Not do you, his. Do you run into problems then? Like, dinner reservations, like, do people no, there's, think? like, a couple times, like, people think it's him. Like, right. it actually mostly happens, like, at airports. Like, they'll see, like, who's, like, going to be on the flight, and then they'll call me up to, like, the to the podium or whatever, and then they'll have like my ticket printed out because they want him to autograph it. Uh -huh. And then I'm like, sorry, it's me. <laughs> but, uh, but, I've had, me. but I've had the Not opposite reaction too, <laughs> where um, I've had like a car service sent for me and they think it's him and then it ends up being me and they're like, oh, thank Christ. Because apparently, <laughs> so apparently he's a giant pain in the ass. Mm. That's amazing. So they're always happy to see me. Uh, I think, uh, do you remember the 1990s film, If Looks Could Kill? Vaguely. All right. Richard, well, Richard Grieco, Grieco at his best. Well done, sir. <laughs> Richard Grieco at his very best. I, I hope you have a situation like that someday. All right. He becomes a super spy. Yeah. When he goes to, like, France. Yes. Or, is he, he goes, supposed to be in high school, even though he's clearly that like is a 35-year-old? Yes. <laughs> he's supposed to be a senior in high school who goes to France. Yeah. The French teacher. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, boy. You know what? Fuck the chat show. Let's just watch that for the Let's next just, 90 minutes. <laughs> I actually do want to see that movie again <laughs> now that you brought it up. Because if I remember correctly, there's, like, a sports car that can shoot missiles at some point. Yeah, he gets a James Bond like, car. Yeah. 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 Awesome. No, it's a great movie. Um, great. God. I, you know what? The podcast is ending early today, folks. <laughs> I'm watching that right now. Um, okay, so by all accounts, uh, you got the bug basically the earliest I've, I've seen, five years old. Yeah. But a five-year-old acting, all of the five-year-olds, any young person who I knew who was acting when they were five, that's got to be 98% the parent. Right. So... Well, because we were so... We were doing theater at right. five. Like, it right. wasn't even an option. Like, we were in Northern California. It was my brother and I both got into acting. And it was just like anything else. You know, it was like... We took karate, we took piano lessons, and we also did acting classes. Right. But the acting and the plays and stuff, we just loved. And we had... Our dad, you know, we were one of the early adopters for the VHS video camera. Oh, uh, yes. And so we were just making movies constantly at home. Um, we drag all our friends, you know, and in, in, get them involved and make, you know, we try and do special effects and makeup. So we were just constantly doing it. And, you know, I, I like, I watched the behind the scenes, the making of Thriller video oh. over and over and over again. Like, we were just obsessed with movie making and how sure. things were made and acting was all part of that. Um, but it was mostly just theater, like local theater, until I was 10. Um, and that was when I um, auditioned to be in Les Miserables in San Francisco. Right. And that was like, wow, they actually pay you to do this. And that's when my parents sort of realized like, oh, this is a real, this is a thing. Like right. we're not gonna be able to avoid Ryder and Shiloh acting anymore. Because then agents started calling from LA and mm -hmm. saying like, come to LA for pilot season. And my mom resisted for a year and a half. She was like, okay. no, my kids are going to live normal lives. Is They're this not after Les Mis? Yeah. We did Les Mis. Okay. I did Les Mis for nine months. And it was kind of crazy. Like, when you're in a play that young, you know, professional gig like that, they're scared you're going to grow too quickly. So sure. every week they would measure us <laughs> in the theater. And we knew that if we got too tall, because, you know, they're all 20-something-year-old actors. If we, like, were older, or if we looked bigger on stage yeah. than any of the adults, they were screwed. Like, they lost the whole... Um, it was actually, do you know Larissa Olenek, the I actress? I sure do. She was in it with me. We were both cast together in San Francisco, um, and we've known each other ever since, and been friends ever since, and actually worked together a bunch of times. But um, they would measure us, you know, all of us, and my mom just thought that that was kind of weird. Mm -hmm. And and after I had done nine months of the show, the, the, the fact that at any moment we could get fired, my mom was like, I don't want to do this to Ryder. So she pulled me out of the play. She was like, let's move on. Let's go back to do normal things. And like, we took a family vacation. And, um, and I just thought that might be the end of, of acting, you know? And, but then the people kept calling, the managers and agents, and really putting the pressure on my parents. And I wanted to do it, you know? My, sure. my, mom, my brother and I were like, please let us do this. If we really, you know, at that point, I don't think we understood exactly what it meant. We just, we knew we liked movies and plays and all yeah. of this. Uh, and then it meant three months in LA with my mom and we both booked jobs. Like I got a TV series and Shiloh got a movie. And yeah. it was like, then we were off to the races. And, and my first series was the, the Julie Andrews thing. That Julie! You <laughs> yes, which was huge because, you know, of course, I of course. like every kid, I grew up with Sound of Music and Mary Poppins. So playing Julie Andrews' son was like a big deal. Oh, yeah. Um, and 
when that show, we lasted only six episodes, and when that, you know, when that show got picked up, I thought like, I'm, I'm gonna be the biggest star in the world. <laughs> and then it just like got dumped on a Saturday on ABC in the summer. Like they just showed the six episodes and like buried yeah. it. Because yeah. it was probably horrible. I haven't gone back and watched it. But uh, so when Boy Meets World came around like two years later, a year and a half later, I was already like an old hack. Like just mm -hmm. like, well, this show will never go. It's never gonna be more <laughs> than a pilot. <laughs> And then yeah. seven years of my life, like, you know, yeah. 13 to 20. Like, that was oh boy. all Boy Meets World. That's um, it, that's it. But, yeah, but, when I, but when, boy, when I booked Boy Meets World, did not care. You know, I, I, like, just thought this was just a flash in the pan. Sure. Like, going to be this. And then, you know, of course, yeah. just the way things work out. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, just my last question about Julie. Yeah. Do you recall the episode where she sang with a monkey? Yeah. Well, we had a lot of animals on that show. It was actually why it was part. <laughs> this, this is real. Okay. They so, made Julie Andrews sing with a monkey, folks. Look it up. Yeah. That, what happened to that show was originally it was called Millie. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the show was that she was a, a, like a Julie Andrews type, like a, a song, a, a singer, dancer, performer. And she had a variety show. Yeah. So it was about a woman who had a variety show, but then like had a family by day. So it was like <laughs> variety show by night, family by day. And it was fine. It was like a lovely pilot. Yeah. And I had a great role. I was her her son who had um, grabbed a girl's boob at school. Mm -hmm. And so she had to like talk to me about sex. It was a great episode, it was very funny. And I was like sort of be you know, being peer pressured and didn't understand what I had done. Mm. It was a funny episode. Uh, and then they decided to, once the show got picked up, reinvent everything and decided it's <laughs> better. Works. Yes, and it's better not only is she, uh, not hosting a variety show. She used to host a variety show, and now she married a an exotic animal veterinarian in Sioux City, Iowa, and she's moving the whole variety show to Sioux City, Iowa, and she doesn't have a family, but now she's adopting his family with his kids. Uh, so it became like a story on a story on a story, like the way yeah. networks love to like just pile it up and make like shake it. And it was a disaster. And yeah. uh, Blake Edwards, her husband, and an amazing director, mm -hmm. directed all the episodes. Right. <clears throat> had never done multicam, no. which, as you know, is a very specific art very form. Specific. It's like, you have to know how to direct this style of thing. If you've been doing amazing films like he had all his career, you kind of can like freewheel and you have a budget that goes forever. So it took us, I think, six weeks to shoot one episode. Like oh he just, God. he would like, Improvise. He would see something happen. And he'd be like, "We should add a character that comes in here, bursts through the wall," to, and then he would rewrite the whole episode. Right. And like we'd all just be sitting around going, "Okay." So the show just kept changing and evolving. I'm, the network hated it. I'm, yeah. And as far as I know, like yeah, they just by the time we finished six episodes, they dumped it. They just oh. didn't care. So the show ends, and you're figuring, "Ah, that showbiz. What are you gonna do?" Yep. Let's see what comes rolling my way next. Yeah. And then I think I did like a couple movies, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm in all the you just. Like I was saying earlier, it's interesting when you're a kid actor, like you're actually in a very small pool, you know, once yeah. you've worked, like once you've done a job or two. And so it's like, you know, the, the five people you're always up against job, you know, and some yeah. of them are still acting. Like for me, it's like Elijah Wood mm -hmm. and like uh, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Like some of these guys are still working and doing very well. And like oh, others, you never heard from again. The, like, unfortunately, the bulk Charlie you never Charlie Cosmo, heard from again. like I, I used to lose jobs to him all the time. Like all those Disney films for yeah. like three years was like, Dick Tracy, and, and, right, and yeah. then he kind of just disappeared. And then he, just, he said he gave the finger to uh, the industry, to right? the industry yeah. after I think Can't Hardly Wait was the last thing, right, right. And but he, he went like, to MIT. Or oh, something? you know, he's brilliantly smart. Right, and he was like, right. "Fuck this! Oh, why am I wasting my life? You know, at auditions for? Right, I'm gonna go create something that can benefit mankind. Oh. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, we don't have that guts. <laughs> don't have it. Um, so. Uh, um, all right, we're going to jump around a little. Yeah. Yes, we're going to get to Boy Meets World. Jesus Christ. I can hear you yelling at the screen. Stop yelling. Sorry. I had to address them. Um, I want to jump around because uh, in my research, there were a couple of, of stories that I learned about you on the oh, set of no. My Giant. Oh, God. <laughs> that I think are fucking great. What stories did you hear from My okay, Giant? Oh, no. so, so here's... Wait, please tell us a little bit. So it was just another audition. Yeah. This is later in the career. This is in the middle of Boy Meets World, I know. Yes. Uh, I guess you shot it in like 97, probably. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, and so you auditioned for this movie starring Billy Crystal, mm -hmm. George Mirasan. Yep. It's loosely based on Billy Crystal's own experiences working with Andre the Giant. Right, right. Uh, and so you go to Prague. Yeah. 
to shoot this thing. Had you been, had you ever shot overseas before? No, and that was, it was, it was actually, I think it might have been 96 because it was right when I had first become emancipated. So, you know, like at the age of 16, you can legally become 18. Right. So what that meant is that I was able to go overseas without a parent. Um, mm. So my brother went with me actually. Wow. Yeah, so the two of us, he was probably 18, 17, and I was, 16, 17. Recipe for disaster. We had so much fun. Yeah, like, I, I think that was my first, I think it was my first sip of beer was mm -hmm. in Prague because there's like nine cents for a beer there. And at least also, it used to be. they yeah. don't card. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, and it was a blast. Like, yeah, and what was the, the, the coolest part about it was it was a movie within a movie. Right. So I had, I w within my giant, we were filming some fantasy film. Mm -hmm. And so I had to take sword fighting classes. And like, I got really? to, yeah. And so, and some of the people we were working with had, uh, like were stunt guys from Braveheart, which yeah. like I was still in my obsessive Braveheart phase. Sure. So it was just like working with those guys. And he here's here's the thing that you, you don't realize when you grow up sword fighting with your friends, like playing around, which mm -hmm. is like we had always done, you're aiming for each other's sword. Right. When you're actually trying to kill somebody, you have to aim for the person. <laughs> like that was the hardest part for me to learn. That yeah. and not making my own sound effects. Like you realize <laughs> that like, all you know, like when, when you're 16, you're like, I'm in a movie where I get to play with a sword. And you're like, <laughs> shoom, 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 shoom. it's like, that doesn't, you, you don't do that. You yeah. know, and like, I, so it took me like a week of sword fighting training to learn, like actually aim for the mm -hmm. face, actually aim for the body and like block this way as opposed to like aiming for the sword. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was just a regular audition and I got to go to prom. Um, and honestly, like, the best part was working with Billy Crystal. Like, he was just a god to me at that point, because, like, Princess Bride especially had been, like, one of my favorite movies when Harry met Sally. Mm -hmm. um, so just being around him, and he couldn't have been nicer. And he was, he was a producer on the film, and it was sort of, you know, inspired by his relationship with Andre the Giant. And that, you know, that little backstory um, I really loved. Movie, movie didn't turn out so great. Well, but, like they can't, can't all be winners. Can't they can't all be winners. No. <laughs> uh, so George Marisson is seven foot seven. Yeah, that is ludicrously tall. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and so I, I don't know if you've seen the film. I, I saw the film in theaters, no less. <laughs> yes. And uh, and I vividly, of course, remember the the scene, the, the movie within the movie. So they get George Marisson's character yes. to act in this movie with right. you right. that they're shooting, and uh, he's supposed to be this big villain. And then I guess he gets sick, and then uh, you vomits have this, this great line, and then he vomits all over you, yeah. which of course is a double victory for the crowd because your character has been portrayed as something of a snot. Yes, yes. Yeah, so here's my favorite <laughs> part of that, and I don't want to tell the story for you. The, the puke substance. Yes that they made yes. that gets spewed all over mm. you. Right, they decided to, they had to find the right amount of like food and non-food mixture. Right. Like, so they didn't want to put like completely inedible stuff on me, but in order to get the right texture, I'm not sure exactly what they mixed in, <laughs> but it was this giant vat that they had built I, up. I'm guessing asbestos, yeah, mostly it asbestos. Was, it was not, but there were a lot of um, Czech Republic extras mm -hmm. that, we're working as like peasant people in the background of the movie within the movie. Right. <laughs> so there were probably over a hundred extras that day um, who didn't know where their food was coming from necessarily. Mm -hmm. And they saw this vat of vomit, fake vomit, and uh, lined up for <laughs> chow time. And I'm not sure how long it took before somebody finally like stopped them and was like, this is the, this is a prop. Please stop eating. It's not some uh, weird American soup. Uh, I mean, it was disgusting looking. I yeah. mean, it was just, yeah. I don't know why the phrase weird American soup. Like, <laughs> I think like, that that's what they assumed. It was yeah. like, well, like we're on a set. Island. This is free food. Yeah. <laughs> weird American soup. Yep. <laughs> I love yeah. it. That, I guess it just goes to uh, the lead you to believe that the food in the Czech Republic is terrible. It's, <laughs> I mean, at that point, I think they had just like sort of emerged out from, you know, right. Soviet, uh, Soviet era. <laughs> they were, era they, yeah. gruel. Yeah, I think that there was a little like, <laughs> welcome to Europe, guys, yeah. and here's a Hollywood movie crew. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, um, that's fantastic. It was great. Though. I loved Prague. Um, I haven't been back since, uh, yeah. but that was like one of my first exposures to Europe. And, you know, going back uh, as I got older, uh, um, 
that was like always my 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 big introduction. My brother and I running around Prague together. It was really fun. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it was a good life. It was one of those like, this is what being an actor is, you know, all sure. about. Like getting to go cool places and yeah. meet new people, getting paid to be here, like, and learn to sword fight. Like, yeah, being an actor can be really fun. It can be very fun. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I know I don't think you guys share any scenes together, but did you know that Dan Castellaneta? Yes, is in that. Feature? I know, and it took me so long to remember, and then we brought it up when we worked together on Veronica Mars. And that's how we segue, folks. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Uh, so when you and I worked together at long last in 2006 on Veronica Mars, mm -hmm. uh, we had the pleasure of working with the legendary Dan Castellaneta. Yeah. Um, how much fun was that? It was incredible. By the way, just hanging out down in San Diego. It was great. That was so much fun. It was a, it was a weird episode because we were a big part of it. Like yeah. you and I, and like our whole like Stanford prison experiment drama, like was the whole. That was it. it was like yeah. a whole B story of the episode. So we spent a lot of time like in those weird little dorm room area mm -hmm. sets. Just yeah. Um, People have have often asked me about that episode, and more than. 10 people have written to me about that online and, and cited as, and I'm quoting here, it's the episode where Sean Hunter made Neil Schweiber cry. Oh. And I'm like, you know what, guys? You, sometimes actors have other roles too. <laughs> That's what I have to explain to them. Yeah, but they were kind of riffing on our... They like, really were. They, they were like extreme versions, like the <laughs> evil extreme versions <laughs> of the characters we enjoyed character. already. Yeah. Right? It's kind of true. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was fun, though. I remember getting into it. Like, we had a blast. Oh, uh, that it was super fun. I, the thing I remember about it most was the last day we shot uh -huh. was one of the longest on-set days I've ever had. Oh, right. At least in the United States. Right. I feel like we worked for like 19 hours. Yes, and I remember you just being like, overtime, baby. I was, I had done the math he and was I was like, we so are happy about it overtime. right now. <laughs> With each passing minute, they and owe I, us a You were the one who pointed that out. I was like, really? He like, was, so, I remember, because I hadn't even thought about it. I just remember being tired and miserable and you were like, no, 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 this is really good for us. I was like, you're right. This is really oh, good for I was us. tired and miserable, but right. when we hit golden time, golden time, <laughs> which is five times your hourly rate, ladies mm -hmm. and gentlemen, when we hit golden time, I was like, well, now I don't have Keep to worry about working the rest of the month. Yeah, no, this is fantastic. <laughs> um, I remember for me, I was as as happy as I was to hit golden time. That last day was kind of a nightmare because I knew once we wrapped, I couldn't even go back to the hotel and sleep. I had to drive back up to L.A. because that same night was the premiere of the Pulse horror movie of yes. Pulse, the horror movie that I'd done with Kristen That's Bell. That's right. I remember that. She wasn't working that day. No, no, she got the day off to go to L.A. early. I had to stick around her own set. Uh, and I had to be film the her show for her. schmuck there at, at six in the morning. Oh my God. Yeah, but uh, we had a, a lot of fun, and I think that episode is available on Netflix. I believe all of Veronica Mars is. And if you haven't seen that episode, first off, if you haven't seen Veronica Mars, what's wrong with you? Great show. Secondly, if you're like, ah, I've got too many shows to watch, then just watch that one. It's sometime in season three, and I think it's called My Big Fat Greek Rush Week. That's right if I had to guess. yeah. Um, but yeah, that was super fun for me because you and I had known each other. I just remember you and I hung out the whole time. The like whole there was time. a lot of downtime where we yeah. would just shoot the shit and yeah. hang out. And there yeah, was. It was fun. And, uh, and, I, and I hope we get to do that again soon. Yeah. All right, guys, I've made you wait long enough. I'm sorry. So jumping back, <laughs> Julie's over. Couple of guest spots here and there. Yep. I saw one on uh, my personal favorite, Going Places. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, with Jerry Levine and yes. Alan Ruck. Yes. And I just got to work with Jerry Levine uh, a couple weeks ago. He uh, directed yeah. an episode of a show I did, and uh, I took great pleasure in telling him, I've followed your career as far back as I can remember. You know, he was Styles and Teen Wolf. I was like, but my favorite thing about you is your last name is Levine. Right. And when I was a kid, the only other Levine in show business I knew of was Ted Levine, right. Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. Right. So not, not exactly not someone model. you want to aspire to. 
Uh, and wait, then, uh, wait, was she a great big fat? Right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yes, sir. She was a big girl. Yeah. Um, so, so I was I was very excited to yeah. hang out with Jerry Levine. I love Jerry. He actually started directing on on Boy Meets World. That uh -huh. was his first directing gig um, because he grew up with the creator of Boy Meets World, Michael oh. Jacobs. So I did Going Places with him, and I was obsessed with Teen Wolf as a kid. Like sure. that was my number one movie. So all I cared about being on uh, going on Going Places was that I could be around him. Yeah. And then he showed up on Girl Meets World on Boy Meets World. Um, he played. He everyone will know him as Mr. Mac, mm -hmm. the uh, cult leader in the the infamous <laughs> cult episode of Boy Meets World. It's a classic. Uh, my my so character my character uh, joins a cult. Uh, gets because of a girl, right. then goes psychotic, becomes completely brainwashed. Mm -hmm. Then my teacher gets into a motorcycle accident, and I leave the cult and discover God all in the course of 22 minutes. This wow. is when TGIF has to get serious. Yes. Oh, we did a lot of very yeah, special you episodes. Yeah, you know, they have to take on yeah. serious issues. But that episode yes. ends with me, like, literally over a bedside with somebody in a coma giving a, like, Two minute monologue. It's wow. super intense for <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's like probably more intense than anything Girl Meets World is that for, for some wow. reason on, on TGIF we would just do these episodes that were like full on dramas and uh, nobody seemed to notice. It's, you're absolutely right. And only in hindsight do we even remember that. It's the thing I always think about is uh, that scene on Fresh Prince of Bel Air, mm -hmm. and I know you, you'll know the scene I'm talking really? about. It's the one. It's the it's the only, it's the most dramatic scene they ever had on the show, where uh, James Avery, I think that was the character the actor's name, he he has to have like a real heart to heart with Will about Will's real father and how he's not coming to save him. No, I've never. And seen it that. gets fucking dark and deep and emotional and he cries in his arms. Oh my God. And like the show ends, there's no laughter, there's no nothing. Like it's this intense scene that lasts about five minutes mm -hmm. and then just cut to black. Yeah. And I remember as a kid watching it going, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> yeah. I, I come to this show for laughter right. and levity. Right. And I, I feel like a broken man right now. I think it's kind of cool when they do it. I don't know, like, because yeah. when you do a tonal shift like that, it either, I mean, I think, I think Boy Meets World missed the mark Almost as often as it, it <laughs> nailed them. No, honestly, like well, for the people that it, different audience. Well, different but I audience. think the people that it that you know, like for some people, that tonal shift will never work. Right. You know, it's just like whoa. Like I come here, I want it to be funny, and then for other people, like and I think what Boy Meets World and Girl Meets World tapped into is like. It's it, there's actually a, a huge segment of that that age group, you know, w yeah. which is the target age group from I guess eight all the way up to sixteen ish. Mm -hmm. Like. Um, that is very melodramatic. That does yeah. see life as sort of like, it's all fun, it's sort of da, 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 and then like the rug gets pulled out from under you and you're like crying. And, you know, that sort of emotional, like the swings. And I think uh, Michael, to his credit, really wrote well for that, you know, and he still he still does. Like Girl Meets World, it's a very, we have like, we've had some very dramatic episodes and yeah, now, I don't think as dramatic as Boy, yeah. um, mostly because we're on Disney Channel and they won't allow us to. I think if sure. Michael um, had had his way, Girl Meets World would have swung just as extreme. And, and I think that, you know, sometimes, like I said, it misses and other times when it, it hits, um, it really, you know, it touches people and it, la it sticks with them in a way like you remember that Fresh Prince episode. Sure. I think a lot of people remember Boy Meets World episodes. I remember like, plenty of those. These are, this is intense. And like, yeah. you know, we're, they're talking about Sean's lack of a father or lack of a mother or what, you know, whatever you're really getting into. And um, yeah, and I, and I think for me as an actor, I didn't really make a distinction between like sitcom and drama. Like I didn't, I just, Played the drop, you know. I just yeah. played what they wrote, and often <laughs> that that led to some really heavy, <laughs> really did like Dawson's Creek acting in the middle of Boy Meets World, you know. And it's like totally, you watch it again, you're like, was that right? We should yeah. I have committed that much to this, like. Yeah. But whatever, you know. No, it. it uh, well, it all obviously we're all good choices because yeah. here we are, twenty five almost years later, and people are still and it's talking still about it and as it. as big a topic as yeah. as the Wonder Years and yep. other other shows about coming of age. Yeah. Um, here's something that I am not at all surprised to learn. Uh, so Will Friedle, yeah, uh, who I, I worked with over 10 years ago, and he's a great actor, super funny. Yeah. He is one of the most conversationally funny people I've ever met. Genius, like, genius. And I mean, everybody that used to guest star on Boy Meets World would say that. Like, yeah. major comedians would come through and they'd be like, I've never, I've never met a funnier human being in my yeah. life. He it really is. It's ridiculous. Like, his wit is like three levels beyond. So he'll just be in like a normal conversation and then you walk away and you're like, oh, he totally 
totally just like <laughs> added all these layers, and right. it takes you that long to like get all the jokes. Right. Yeah, he's brilliant. But I'm, then you and he turned into something of a Horatio Sands Jimmy Fallon pairing. Yes. In as much as they couldn't write scenes that the two of you were in. Nope. Because there would just be a look. Yep. Between the two of we you, and you do it. both we lose it. We couldn't do it. You we still can't, really. <laughs> we still can't. I mean, a girl meets world. We're, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but we're in the final episode together, and mm -hmm. we we don't have a line to each other wow. because we we're in a scene together. Can't. But we can't. I mean, it's like it's hard. It's hard. Will is so <laughs> funny, and it's a real. Um, you know, there's all different types of funny, and you know, some people are like improv funny, um, and he he's all types of funny, mm -hmm. but. It's never the same way twice. No. It's, and not necessarily, he doesn't change lines. He'll do that too, improv. But his intonation, he, he finds music in the way he's saying something. So you watch episodes like a boy, and they would just, every take, they would just roll. And he would, you know, be doing these voices and these things and these, and that's why the character just became so absurd because yeah. they had to, because they had to make room for his sense of humor. It was like, there's no other way that they could see the range of like voices and like little things and weird tones and songs he could do. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, he is so talented beyond belief. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, one of my best friends. All right, Will, come on out. Oh, now he's in the valley. He'll do it. He'll come on the show. He would, <laughs> he would love to. Yo, he's, yeah. You know, he Will went through a period where he was like no on camera work. Like he didn't want to. He just yeah, does. He, he did cartoons, voice. and he still yeah. does a lot of cartoon work. But no, he really after Boy, he did like a couple small movies, and then he was like done, done with the industry except for voiceover. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna live my comfortable life and not have to put you know this pressure myself to be on camera, mm -hmm. which I get. Like you know, I mean, I'm not really acting anymore, and and. And I, but I think for him it was definitely like, and now he's back. Like now he wants to be on camera again. He wants Good. to do more. And yeah, the world is going to be better for it. Like I he's, could not agree. So he's like going to conventions now, and he, you know, he's 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 doing interviews. So yeah. he, he would come on this show. Whereas I would say a year and a half, two years ago, no chance in hell. Yeah. So that's right, a well, good, good development. I'm gonna yeah. book him. Mm -hmm. We're gonna book him. <laughs> um, uh, so um, what was the question I had for you? Oh yeah. This uh, this is terrible. Okay. This is terrible. So when you're on a long-running show like that, yeah, um, and you know it's coming to an end, yeah, everyone's mind. If you're an actor on the show, goes the same way. You're like, fuck. What am I gonna steal right. from this set? Oh, good. I like. What am going. I gonna steal from this set? Yeah. That you know, it's gonna, it's gonna mean last. a lot to me, right. and I'm gonna have it the rest of my life, and it's gonna be my personal memento of my whole time there. Yeah. And so what did you go with? Um. So in the student union, mm -hmm. there was, uh, which was in the college years of the show, so the last two or three seasons of the show, there was a giant painting of an old blues singer that was figured very prominently on like a high part of the, the set, because it was a big open set. It was basically like our coffee shop pool table hangout set. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just loved this painting, I always loved it. It's a painting of Robert Nighthawk. Um, and I waited till the last taping, and when everything was shut down and everybody was gone for the night, there were a couple of us. It was, I think Danielle was still there, Will had already gone home, and a couple crew members. Um, and I was like, I'm gonna tape that. And I grabbed it and threw it in the back of my girlfriend's truck and drove away with it. And uh, I've never told anybody. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, and, I, and what, what, what I think was a mistake about that was that it wasn't owned by the show. I think that was part of Michael Jacobs' private collection. Because <laughs> I think he personally put like paintings on the set that he yep. picked out. Yep. So I think I might have stolen it from my executive producer and he never knew until just now. You know what? Unless... I'm pretty sure the statute of limitations. <laughs> yeah, and it's not like an amazing painting. It's one of those paintings, I, I'm not sure who the, the artist is, but it's, 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 it's a guy who did musicians, yeah. so he probably had like pumped out a bunch of these. So it's not yeah. like it's an extremely rare, but I definitely stole it. I know somebody on the cruise took um, the Shakespeare bust that okay. was always on uh, Mr. Feeney's desk. Yep, yep, yep. So that got stolen. I'm not sure what Ben kept. Will still has, he has a couple uh, Penbrook University sweatshirts, which mm -hmm. is pretty great, because that's the school we created. I wanted to steal from Girl Meets World, I wanted to steal, um, uh, Mr. Matthews' name tag, which got flipped over f for Farkle, and then uh, there was an episode where Farkle flipped it over another time to become Donnie Barnes' regular guy. It was just this great little thing, and Shiloh and I had directed the episode where it had been flipped over for the third time, and uh, but we didn't know the show was canceled when we were done, oh. so I didn't want to take anything in case right. we came back, so I didn't, and now I really wish I had. Ah. Uh, yeah. 
Well, maybe we'll call up uh, Michael Eisner. Yeah. I don't think he's the, has he's anything not, to do with nothing them anymore. Nothing to do with it. Um, since 94. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so actually, I didn't know about the painting, and how yeah. could I, since you've never told that story. I was actually uh, hinting about the leather jacket. Oh, yes. I did take the leather jacket. I took a lot of the wardrobe. Yeah. Uh, they didn't care as long as we replaced it and told Disney that we hadn't taken anything. So right. like, I just gave them some cheapo leather jacket and took the actual leather jacket. I was right. very happy to have, you know, have this because I knew it was like the sort of signature thing. Yeah. And here's the little bit of trivia that everyone's gonna forget. If you go back to first season Boy Meets World, Will Friedle wears that jacket. What? It was originally his character's jacket in first or second season. And it wasn't until like halfway through the second or third season that they were like, uh, Ryder, you put on this jacket. Cause at that point, like wardrobe was just kind of, they were still figuring out our characters and it just became my signature jacket from that point on. And Will yeah. still claims, he's like, it was originally mine. And he's right, there are episodes that we filmed where he's wearing that jacket. So anyway, I took it and moved to New York and it was stolen out of my car in Brooklyn. Devastating. I came, I heard my car alarm going off. I was living in Williamsburg and I came outside and the window was broken and uh, my speakers had been taken and the leather jacket, oh. which is my own fault for just leaving it on a car seat. Now, what are the odds that whoever pilfered this jacket, like Knows. got it home, and then some tween looked at it and went, oh my God, it's Sean's jacket. None. There's no, no chance. There's no chance. Uh, no, they, I mean, hopefully it's keeping them warm and they're just I, you know, blissfully ignorant of its history. I say they didn't come for the speakers. They came for the jacket. It was all like a- took the speakers <laughs> to, to cover up the crime. Oh, uh, I see. To cover up the true But then it would pop crime. up on eBay like any day now mm. and it'd be like worth- We'll bring out the jacket. <laughs> No, that's, we don't have we don't have the jacket. Either. Will stole it. It was all an operation to get it back. I told you it was mine. It was mine. It always be mine. Yeah, no, oh. it was funny when they asked me to come back on Girl Meets World, and you know we were going back and forth about whether I would do it and and all that. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, just don't make me wear a leather jacket. Just don't. Make, and then Michael Jacobs actually wrote it into the later episodes of the show <laughs> where my character goes and puts on a leather jacket. He like, yeah. and that was definitely like there. And there was a moment where once we started filming and I was playing Sean again, I was like. Really, I should have just worn a leather jacket and shown up with like a wig with the exact same hair <laughs> and like shave and just been like, if I had shown up like looking exactly the same, it would have been so disturbing. And like, and yet it would have been exactly what the audience kind of wanted. Yeah. So there would have been this weird like, oh, I think that's what I want. But yeah, yeah I wish we had done that. And then I could have just wi ripped off the wig and been like, this sucks. Here's who I really am. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, you, uh, the, the hair. Oh, you poor bastard. It was, you know, it was my own fault. Um, I was, just, you know, I mean, at that age, at 13, you just, you, you, you wore your hair how girls told, told you, you that it was cool. And like, I had, I had gone to a, a party where I let girls play with my hair. Cause you know, I didn't, I didn't have any fashion sense. I had no clothing sense, hair sense, anything. And um, it was right before the, the Boy Meets World audition. These girls were like, part your hair down the middle. Mm. You know, you look like Christian Slater. That was like, you know, the guy at the time. And I was like, okay. Yeah. And sure enough, <laughs> I booked Boy Meets World and they wanted me to keep the hair. And then it kept growing and they wouldn't let me cut it. Yep. And then my hair is like actually pretty wavy and they would straighten it. And then they started putting straightener in it, yeah. which is like the tingly, like leave it a, like relaxer. It was. My hair like took up so much of my time and so much of my energy and then became this like thing, you know. And we all had it. All those 90s kids had that. You did. Oh, They had good old Hanson hair. Yeah. 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 Um, so sorry. It's okay. You know, there are, there are way worse things in the world. Indeed there are. Um, but yes, I used to, when I, when my hair was longer, I would do like, you know, do this to push it out of my hair. Sure. And then it started becoming like a thing, like, cause I was doing it as a nervous habit, like on camera all the time. I always figured you're just trying to remember lines. No, well probably that, <laughs> a little bit of that too. But it was so weird after the show, like if my hair gets long, like I still do that, like to get it out and, and I can't do it. Like I find myself going to do it in public and it's, right. it's one of those weird like identity things that kind of gets out of your control mm. where you're like, Oh, this used to just be a part of me, but now it's a part of me. That like the public rule, and I was I can't, and that's a weird like fame issue that you never think about, you know. But, that's terrible. Yeah, so I'll never wear my hair like that again. Oh, uh, and and the world is sorrier for it. You see what you did, Michael Jacobs. God damn it. Um, now we I, we asked for questions from yeah. the Twitterverse yeah. a couple hours ago, and about. 
98% of them are all just very generic Boy Meets World questions. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I'm not going to I'm not going to ask you any of them cuz they're all just, you know, favorite episode this that the other. But I guess I'll I'll just say dealer's choice. Mm. Can you please share with me maybe your favorite one or two Boy Meets World stories? Um, stories or episode? You mean just like Just a story it can be about anything that happened, maybe a a, a shared moment that uh, we would never have known about, um, not, not unlike the uh, stealing yeah. of the painting. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, the the the, the two. I'll just pick the the, the two episodes that I think. Um, I I've, I've told these stories before, but I think they they do illustrate like moments in the show's evolution. Sure. The first one was like the fifth episode of, of the show is called Corey's Alternative Friends, mm -hmm. and the reason that episode was important is because it was the the first episode that Topanga made an appearance. And mm -hmm. originally she was just a guest star. And everything sort of came together about the show at that point. Um, until, you know, when we first started the show, it was called the Untitled Ben Savage Project. And it was really just a vehicle for, for Ben because he was already, you know, his brother had had Wonder Years and he was an actor in his own right at that point. And the network was like, well, let's do, let's rec let's do a Wonder Years-ish show mm -hmm. with this, um, with the younger brother. And so they built the show around him, um, but I don't think they were sh quite sure, anybody was quite sure how the balance between like school and family and like friends, like, is this gonna be a family show about Corey and his parents and his older brother is this going to be a show about you know and it obviously ended up becoming a show mostly about his love for Topanga you know mm -hmm. and that sort of social evolution like to the ending you know culminating with their marriage and and then Girl Meets World being about their family and so this fifth episode uh, when we were filming it they they had been trying to find they wanted Corey to have two best friends I was one of uh, three or one of yeah, there was there were three of us, and uh, actually somebody who was on Freaks and Geeks, Chauncey Leopardi, was the original other best friend. <laughs> I and almost just <laughs> named you, Chauncey right? as right. someone who got stuck with a bad haircut. Really? And then they they punished him a little bit for changing his hair without telling him. There you go. Yeah, See, that's why I never did it. I was a good good child actor. Good kid. Um, but anyway, so Chauncey was in the pilot. He still is in the pilot, and and me. And then after that, we had a revolving door of best friends. Like I was always there next to Ben, but then we all had a third best friend right. and it was just we called there was a chair in the cafeteria we called the death chair <laughs> because whoever would be in it would be gone by the next week mm -hmm. and when we got to Corey's alternative friend episode um, it's the episode where Ben um, straightens his hair actually and uh, you know it was a very funny episode but the whole the 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 whole thrust of the episode was that Corey's friend who was his other character, had a sister who straightened her hair, and he shows Ben how to straighten his hair. Halfway through the week, they fired that kid. Mm. And they, they didn't have an option, so they just looked at me, and they were like, okay, we'll write the whole, your, it's your sister now, which right. is why Sean has a sister that never reappeared. Never is mentioned and, right, again. And it was just this one-off episode. But what that meant for me is I went from having two lines to actually having a significant influence on the plot. Right. And it also introduced Danielle Fischel as Topanga, and I think everything just came together. Like, it was just the greatest episode that we had done up until that point, and I think the, the I remember the tape night so vividly, like, feeling this energy from the audience and, and from the cast, like, oh, this is what we're doing. Like, this, the story just came together. And, you know, it's an interesting process. Like, you know, everyone thinks that, like, a TV show just comes out, but the truth is, what makes good, great, good TV shows great is um, that they write for their actors. Mm -hmm. There's like a, there's a real process, you know, it's like a theater troupe. You sort of develop it together. And I think that's when it really started happening. Like everything kicked in. So that's a classic episode. And then the other one is the Scream episode, or we call the Scream episode. Right. And the, then like, there was Sean. And then there was Sean, that's the name of yeah. it, right? And that was just the most fun I've ever had on a set ever in my life. And you can feel that when you watch the episode. It's yeah. sort of a classic. That's of, a terrific episode. It was so fun. It's just yeah. absurdist. And it was written by Jeff Minnell, who's one of our writers, and he was a writer on Gorman meets world too and he's such a great guy and he used to be he's a big horror film buff mm -hmm. and uh, he was a film reviewer before he became a tv writer and he just he just wanted to riff on all the current horror films yeah. and south park there's south park there's references. a lot of there's so many it's like yeah. the most out there episode <laughs> we ever did and i remember while we were doing it we just reached this point where it was like what is happening but we didn't care we were having so much fun like yeah. jennifer love hewitt was guest starring because she and will were dating at the time mm -hmm. and she's playing jennifer love pepperman and we were just laughing 
the entire time. And I think that's when, like, I mean, obviously we were all friends, the cast, we were all friends, but that's when we were like, oh, we're, we're lifelong friends. Like, we've, we've been through the trenches yeah. of this absurd episode <laughs> together. It was so much fun. It's a, very, it's a classic. Yeah, yeah, it is a classic episode. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing those uh, uh, yeah. stories and memories with, with me and us. Yeah. And uh, please excuse me because uh, gotta gotta do, take care of a little business here. Uh -huh. But before I get to this, hey Kenny, would you do me a favor and grab another bottle of water for our kind guest? Thank you. Hey, let me tell you a little bit about Blue Apron. It's a fantastic delivery service that helps you create incredible home cooked meals stress free. Here are a few reasons Blue Apron is the best out there. Their seafood is sourced sustain sustainably, sustainably under standards developed in partnership with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. That's right, they're not just doing it on their own. They got great sources helping them make sure they're doing it right. All their beef is raised humanely. Their chickens are free range. Their pork is raised naturally. Blue Apron can be delivered to 99% of the continental US. That's a lot of the US, as far as my math is concerned. Um, and here are a few of the meals available in January. They have seared pork chops with farro and cranberry chutney. They have spaghetti squash and marinara with much mushrooms and garlic knots. They have spicy shrimp and Korean rice cakes with cabbage and furikake. And I looked it up, you weirdos. That is a specialty Japanese seasoning that sounds delicious. So here's what you're gonna do. You are going to check out this week's menu Oh boy, brace yourselves. You're gonna check out this week's menu and you're going to get your first three meals for free with free shipping. Let me say that again. Three free meals with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash chat show. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. Don't wait, that's blueapron.com slash chat show. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Thank you to them. Now, I want to get to some of our uh, uh, wonderful audience who have been uh, waiting patiently for me to ask some of their questions. Uh, so let's see, we've got a couple of really good ones in here. Um, oh no, we'll get to that, we'll get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll, I, we'll just jump around. Yeah. Uh, At this point, we're not going chronological anymore. We really are not. <laughs> and I, why would we want to? Um, uh, what is your... Oh, music forever in my heart. Uh, that's at I love my Nyler 89 says, tried something like this before and my questions never get picked, so I bother. <laughs> oh, no, that's... That's something different. Um, okay. Because they might read it anyway. Because they Keep might trying. read it anyway. That's the point. Uh, no, here's a, here's a really off-topic question uh, from Beth Ann at It Purple Blue. In the future, would you consider running for political office? Ooh, interesting question. Yeah. Um, you know, that's funny because I, I, I used to. I used to want to be very politically involved. It, I'm, I'm assuming that question might come from the fact that my brother and I made a... Um, we so made an move Obama on. move on yeah. commercial uh, in 2008 for Obama's campaign and um, it was a blast. And yeah, I've always been very, but n in the future, maybe. But like, honestly, being, being a politician, like I have a hard enough, like I have a hard enough time with being famous as an actor. Like mm -hmm. I'm not a huge, I li that's why I'm moving into writing and directing. Like the idea yeah. of being a public figure yeah. uh, isn't super exciting for me, but if it's for something that I believe in, which I, you know, uh, in this day and age, being politically involved uh, is kind of an imperative. Uh, so it, yes, I would probably, if, 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 if people wanted me or, you know, my goal right now is to just be more involved because I feel like for the last eight years, I've taken a lot for granted sure. and sort of assumed uh, uh, a faith in our country that I no longer have. So yeah, like uh, my goal, and I think a lot of people's goal for 2017 is to figure out ways to be more involved. Um, for me, that's gonna just mean on a local level, like I'm just gonna start 
showing up at meetings. It's the best advice I got, um, you know, when we were all despairing post-Trump. Um, the best conversation I had with, with, with somebody who was very politically involved was like, just show up somewhere, mm -hmm. whether it's a neighborhood council meeting or it's just uh, an organization or a charity you believe in. Just by showing up somewhere, you know, not just clicking on your Facebook news feed or sharing something on Twitter, um, you can make a real difference and have an impact um, because you're a body in the room. And that, that's the best advice I've gotten, and, and, I, and that's advice I have not taken for the last eight years. Sure. I've been very much like focused on you know, my own career and my own writing and not worrying about um, being politically uh, influential, but I want to change that, so. But there you go, yeah. it purple blue. I hope that answers your query. Um, so post Boy Meets World, mm -hmm. you did um, the thing that if I were your agent, yeah, I'm, I'm sure your agent was like, no, 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 don't, no, you don't do it, don't yeah. you do it. You went, you know what, uh, had a nice run here, put a little money in the bank, feel like I've accomplished some stuff I want to do, yep. now I want to I want to do something for me, and you went to college. Yeah, which, um, I'm like, yeah, could have been a huge mistake. Maybe it was, but I, 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 I had the best experience and, uh, you know, obviously learned a lot. Um, but yeah, in mm -hmm. terms of like, Putting a, a big dent in my career, I think it was a it was a bold move. I moved to New York and spent four years in New York, going to Columbia, and yeah. uh, I did take semesters off. I took a semester off right after September right. 11th, um, which you know, obviously, like being in New York at that time was kind of a crazy. And I had already I got offered the part in Cabin Fever, mm -hmm. and and right it was like two weeks after September 11th that it started filming. I was like, you know what? I'm going to take the semester off, get out of the city, yeah. go do this thing about virus. A flesh-eating virus, mm -hmm. um, but I just loved the script. I thought it was so funny and weird. Sure. Um, and so I took that semester off, and then I took a semester off to do The Graduate. Um, right. But yeah, the, uh, for, other than that, I was pretty much just focused on school. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, it, I would still audition every once in a while. Like, it, you know, actually, Kid Mayor was while I was still going to school. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, they would fly me out for like screen tests or network tests every once in a while. Like, if the you know, uh, but it didn't work that much, and that's a big like sort of pause um, and then coming back and getting back into the industry and being like, I still want to act. Um, you know, that was an uphill battle, definitely. Yeah, but but it, it, it's definitely, I mean, there have been other actors to, to do that sort of thing. Yeah. And then you never hear from them again. Totally. And you have been, again, you're talking to someone who's been doing research on you pretty exhaustively yes. the last 40 hours. <laughs> I feel like you've been doing just fine yeah. since. Yeah, no, since and, and to be fair, like, you know, acting, I, I, I have a very mixed relationship with because, right. I, because I, I don't like being famous that much. I, and as I've gotten older, um, you know, being an actor is so difficult. Like, I have so much respect for it. Um, especially once I started directing and you start realizing what you want from an actor, which mm -hmm. changed for me. Like I really, I, what I thought people wanted from me as an actor versus once I directed and I saw what I was expecting or what I hoped for um, was were completely different. And so that was an evolution. And you know, as an actor, you, you, you gotta, you gotta give a lot of yourself. You have mm -hmm. to give so much of your life and, um, it's, it's a lot of concern about this. It's a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, just taking care of yourself and, um, and also being emotionally available and putting yourself out there in a way that uh, is very difficult. And uh, as a lifestyle, it's a lot of personal rejection too. Oh, sure. um, you know, going to an audition and being told like, you're not the guy, you're too this, you're not old enough, you're too right. whatever. It's like, you can intellectually say like, oh, it's not about me, it's about the role. Like, we all know that, but it's still, you're the, still the guy standing up in front of the room, in front of a group of people or in the camera and not getting the job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a huge commitment that for me, when I fail at other things in life, like, or when I get rejected at other things in life, for instance, if I write something and, um, you know, it doesn't get produced or sold, or I direct something, or I'm up for a directing gig and don't get the job. In those meetings, in those situations, I'm fine. And the yeah. rejection is fine. It's like, oh, we have a difference of opinion. You obviously have no taste, or you know, whatever. <laughs> it's like so easier for, it's so much easier for me to separate me from the work that I'm mm -hmm. doing. Whereas acting, it's, 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 it's trickier. Like it's separating, sure. you know, and you have to have, 
you know, either maybe it's a really tough ego or maybe it's a super flexible ego. I'm not sure, you know, pick your metaphor. Either way, I don't know if I have it. Yeah. Um, I, I'm too brittle, I think, mm. uh, for acting. So I prefer now to be behind the camera. I prefer to write, direct. It's so much more satisfying. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I have so much respect for actors. And now that I finally understand what it is to be a, a real actor, mm -hmm. um, and once I understood it, I don't know if I have it. So, oh, you know. stop it. Look, here's the deal. If, if, if it ever helps something I write or direct get made for me to be in it, I will. Like my right. first short film um, that my brother and I wrote and directed, we put ourselves in because it was cheaper. It's easier. Right. We were shooting on 35 millimeter film Talk back then. Irish twins. Irish twins, right. Yeah. And that Which, was. Which, by the way, you can uh, watch for $2 on YouTube. Two yes. fucking, $1.99. Spend the money and support short film. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and that was, uh, that was our first. Uh, you know, outing as, as writer directors, and we wanted to do everything right. And mm -hmm. we were shooting on 35 millimeter, which is, you know, the most expensive part of the process back then was the film itself. And so, in order to save takes, we just acted in it ourselves and rehearsed sure. it to death so that on the day we would only do two or three takes of every, every uh, setup. Um, and while doing, you know, once we finished that project, we realized that mostly people would see it as a vanity project. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, these guys wrote and directed this thing so they could act in something, which is true. And But that's not what we wanted to do. We were acting <laughs> in it so we could prove our writing and directing skills. Sure. So since then, we've sort of had a rule like we're not going to put ourselves in any of our stuff. But you know, now, like, if, if we create the right project and, and it helps get it produced for, for me to be in it, I'll, I'll, I'll act again. But I'm not actively, you know, auditioning right. or pursuing anything. And I've acted in Friends stuff. My friend wrote a part for me in this movie, Too Late, Too late. that came oh, out yeah, last no, year. Oh yeah, no, it's on my list. Yeah, and that was fun because um, when your friends write stuff for you or when people uh, that know you a little bit, you know, outside of your public persona, they oftentimes will allow you to take risks that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I got to play a part that I never would play. No, you know? it's pretty. It's pretty different for you. I, yeah. I saw. Oh, I that's right. A, I moderated a Q and A at right. a screening of the film. <laughs> that's right. Um, and I, I really, really, really liked that movie. Thanks, man. And Me talk too. about filmmakers. There, that is a yeah. movie shot on True Thirty Five. Thirty Five. A feature length, independent. Yep. Uh, starring John Hawks, and uh, that movie is available on Netflix and iTunes. Yep. Um, and Check it is out. it is a really different movie. When people are like, oh, Hollywood movies are all the same, this is decidedly different. Yeah. And yeah. I would urge people to check that one out, especially to uh, see you in a very atypical yeah. writer role. Exactly. Well, that's that's yeah. why you do stuff like that. You yeah. know, it's so fun. Um, yeah. And yeah, I've, I, I've, I've noticed that, you know, the industry is an echo chamber in so many ways. It's like, yeah. you're always going to be stuck, playing, like you were saying earlier, like you're always the sidekick you sure. know, guy. And it's like, yeah, whatever whatever you've done before, that's all they want you to do again, over and over <laughs> and over again. And that, you know, you either embrace that and you, you know, just win your inches and change your characters just a little bit here and there or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. But um, for me, like, it, it was very exhausting to, the idea of playing Sean Hunter over and over again. It was actually, when Girl Meets World came around, it was, that was kind of, I would say, the decision like, okay, if I'm going to go back to playing the same character that I stopped playing at the age of 20, now that I'm 30, I was 34, I think, at the time mm -hmm. Girl Meets World was happening, it was like, that's that's kind of saying like this is it guys uh, you know <laughs> this is my thing this is what yeah. I do yeah. and so by embracing playing Sean again I was also sort of embracing saying goodbye to acting in a lot of ways it was mm. like I'm not gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be even harder to reinvent myself after this right. you know so let's just call this the the swan song you I know I'll play Sean one more time for as yeah. as long as the show lasts and then yeah you know. Well, I feel like the way I, in my uh, ideal version, uh, I look at it like uh, our friend Danny Strong. Mm -hmm. um, when his uh, writing and directing career really exploded, yes. it provided him with the financial freedom right. to basically only act on things he really wanted to. Yes. Which, if you're a big star, you already get that freedom yeah. because you're going to get offered everything under the sun, right. and so you just get to say yes to the stuff that you want to do. Right. But when you are not that, and you only want to act, Gotta you basically have to say yes to virtually everything that comes along because right. you don't have a choice right. in the matter. And then whether it's a piece of crap or not, you have to give 100%. Because if time. you pull back, if yeah. you don't give, yeah. it's then th it's on you. Right. You know what I mean? Like it can never be on you. So you have to commit. And I think that was what was hard for me is that I started being 
critical, too critical of the things that I was asked to be a part of, sure. and looking around on you know low budget film sets or short films or whatever it was that I was you know doing work wise, and being like. I think I could do these other jobs better, mm -hmm. and that was when I was like, I have to, I have to do it. Then right. I can't just sit around and talk. It really came down to for me, like I had this moment on a film um, that, you know, you hear about like actors, like the infamous bad actor story is that they won't come out of their trailer, mm -hmm. right? Like actors just like, they're such prima donnas, they just want to sit in their trailer all day and like the whole crew is waiting for them and they just make everybody wait, right? Like that's like this sort of mythological, you know, uh, story that you always hear you know, uh, about Marlon Brando, sure. about, you know, name your famous actor. This has happened to the, you know, you hear this story about. And I was on this little film and uh, I had had to do a scene with a stunt that I did not think was safe. And they had left me literally adrift in a boat that I did not know how to steer. And I was really upset about this experience. Like, and Meanwhile, they, they wanted me to do interviews for some sort of B-roll thing that I did not want to do because I would, didn't want to have to be honest about how horrible making this movie was for me and how unhappy I was. So I was like in my trailer, this is after shooting this scene, I was in my trailer and I was tired and I was upset and like they were, I was just angry and they were you know, knocking on my door for me to do interviews for this B-roll and I wasn't answering and I did not want to come out of my trailer. Yeah. And I was so angry and I realized this is not this movie's problem. This is not this movie. Like, I, I can't be angry at this movie. Like, yeah. I'm responsible for my own career. I'm responsible for my own for being here, for putting myself in this position. I need to do something better. I need to change things up. Like, mm -hmm. and that was for me, like, sort of my rock bottom moment as an actor. And I'm like, oh God, I'm the guy. I'm the guy sitting in my trailer, <laughs> not coming out because I'm too good for this movie. And I realized, like, I don't want to. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be negative about what I do for a living. Like, I can't. You know, I, if, if I judge this movie, then I, I need to go make better movies. And I need to, to do that on my own. Like, I can't, I can't, because treading water as an actor, waiting for those great roles to come along that, you know, would eventually allow me to be in the types of movies I wanted to be in, you mm -hmm. know, the Inglorious Bastards of the World, like those kinds of films that we all, you know, that you've been fortunate enough to be in a bunch of. I, you know, I haven't had that many opportunities like that. And I yeah. think that, um, I don't know, that was sort of the crossroads for sure. me. And, and so moving into writing and directing has been about getting away from that experience. Absolutely, no, and that's the, the reason I mentioned Danny is that's what I, because yeah. uh, when you say that you're done with acting for better or worse, I say I love that you've been writing and directing and you and Shiloh have been so proactive about it. And my hope is that you get to that point where if you are to act, it is not because you have to. It's because right. you read something or someone and I just love you it. And you right. have to do it. In the in much in the case of too late. Yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. I, I can't imagine they were able to pay you handsomely no. on that project. <laughs> I paid to be exactly. in that Exactly. <laughs> so you know, I, yeah. I I I knew when I was watching in that movie, I was like, oh no, he's smiling because he's having a blast. Yes, and that is true. I did have a, so much fun because yeah. that's a movie I really loved. I loved yeah. the script, and my friend wrote it, and you know, he wrote this crazy part for me, and he yeah. knew he was like, writers, gonna, you're gonna like this. And I was yeah. like, this is fun. No. Because because he knows my personality and he knows what I could do beyond Sean Hunter, sure. which is what he wanted me to see me do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I speaking of beyond Sean Hunter, hey, hey Jamal, uh, I just wanted to check in with you and see how the chat room is going. If they're if they're losing their minds about me having not covered uh, what the you know episode six hundred one of Boy Meets <laughs> World was really about. No, and then someone asks like, where can we ask questions? I'm like, you can ask them right here, and then <laughs> nothing. Another yeah, okay, great. Well, then it allows me to talk about Cabin Fever a little yeah. bit more. Oh, here, here, I'll throw out a Boy Meets World story that you like. Oh, please. The, the, I did not know who Bill Daniels was. Ah. I had no concept, right? No, of course. Okay, I mean, I guess I should have, but obviously, it was his voice that was more important to me sure. in my generation. And so there was a moment when we were our executive, a creator and executive producer. His name was Michael Jacobs, and he would give notes and long note sessions, like two-hour note sessions. Oh. They're crazy. They were, they were really fascinating. It was, it was fun. And he still does that on, on Girl Meets World. But we were, um, we were doing, like, I think our third or fourth note session, and I heard Bill Daniels say, now, Michael, and it was like, that's good. <laughs> it was like this, like, you know, short, yeah. like, connection in my brain. I was like, that was totally Kit. He's talking. And so then I went up to him and I was like, you were the voice of Kit from Knight Rider. And he was like, oh, yeah. But for him, it was a great job because for how many years he just had this 
Sit in a booth. Sit in a booth. <laughs> and he was the second lead on a show. And I was so pissed when they rebuilt, re rebooted that show. And they yeah. didn't hire Bill Daniels. What it's a like, waste. come on, it has to yeah. be him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he just wrote a book, actually. Um, I want to read it. I'm excited. And there, apparently, there's a picture of me in it, I'm sure, with the, with the hair. Oh. <laughs> It'd be weird if it were a modern day picture. Yeah. <laughs> just me. <laughs> just you fully bearded. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, so wait, Cabin Fever, yeah. now that we're talking about anti-Sean, mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, I, here's how I first knew about Cabin Fever. I'm shooting a movie in Mexico with Jordan Ladd. Oh, yeah. And that was Club right Dread. after yeah, called yeah. Club Dread. And she had basically just wrapped, because we were there in early-ish 2002. That's right. And so you guys had sort of just wrapped. Uh, cabin Fever, and I think it maybe had been finished cutting, and it was about to be at was it Toronto? Toronto, yep. And uh, and so she was really excited about that movie. Yeah. And I remember asking her, "Oh, like tell me about it. What's it?" And she's like, "Oh, it's the craziest horror movie. Yeah. Like it is a total throwback to the gory horror movies yeah. of the '70s. Yeah. And uh, it's it's great. And I just remember hearing about it, going, "Oh, I need to see this yeah. movie." Yeah. Which is so funny because like that context, I think is often forgotten now but like yeah. at the time when it came out nobody was making films that no r-rated horror like because we were sort of in the scream era of horror films where it right. was like funny horror or like meta horror like right. an old school like just disgusting <laughs> and like people having sex and like you yeah. see naked bodies and you see, like it's it, it so visceral mm -hmm. and like now you know after saw and at, we can sort of all see like oh yeah that was that was in the zeitgeist. But Cabin Fever was ahead of the curve. It was really, especially while we were shooting it, yeah. because, uh, you know, it's Eli Roth, it's his sensibility, obviously. You know, it fits his, his, his style. He, you know, went on to make the Hostel films, and that's his sort of thing. But at the time, like, nobody knew who he was. He was, like, this 26-year-old NYU graduate, and he had this crazy script, um, and we read it, and as a cast, like, I remember showing up on the first day, and I had only, I had met with Eli once or twice, and he just, you know, I, I had auditioned for him, and, and we got along really well, but, like, tonally, that movie, we, it was so weird. It's, like, yeah. funny, but it's also kind of takes itself seriously, right. and we didn't know, like, we didn't know while we, like, when we showed up to, for, for rehearsal, like, we were, like, are we supposed to be winking at the audience at all? Like, are we supposed to know, like, we're in a horror movie, we're the guys, and Eli was, like, no, 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 like, the whole thing is commit. Play it straight. So like Jordan has this famous line, uh, that guy asked for our help and we lit him on fire. And that was the line, it was like, this could be played kind of jokey, like, you know, because right. we did. We lit a guy on fire mm -hmm. and he runs into the wood. And Jordan and I, we had to play this scene emotionally. And I remember sitting there with her and it was like, no, we just play it. Like, you know, as Jordan put it at the time, she's like, it's as serious as cancer. And we're like, okay. And she committed to it. And then sure enough, when it premiered at Toronto, biggest laugh line, <laughs> huge laugh line. Oh, sure. Because that's, you know, it was the midnight screening of uh, Toronto has a midnight section. Mm -hmm. And it, it had this like throwback sort of, you know, cheering and jeering like old school horror film vibe that that didn't exist right then like there was nobody servicing that audience now I think those kinds of movies are being made pretty consistently sure but, yeah but, but at the the, time, there was certainly a, an amount of of heart and gutsiness to it because yes. that was Eli basically taking a big risk that audiences were ready for that sort of yes. thing again yeah uh, and that it would find the audience that he hoped it would and it certainly did yep um, but that film was not uh, as safe a bet in the production process no. as one might think. And no. uh, this was fantastically interesting to me. So I guess the film wound up losing a majority of its funding days before it was supposed to yeah, start. The day I landed to, yeah. to into North Carolina from New York. And that was because of the anthrax scare. Right. Because, because right after September 11th, there were those series of anthrax scares. Yeah. And one of the funders of the film was like, well, I don't want to, this film will never go because it's about a virus and people, you know, and he's like, it'll never, I, well, it's kind of a dick move because he was like, yeah. I'm going to pull on my money unless you put my daughter in the movie. Oh, that was his plan all along. Right. And, 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 and to Eli's credit, you know, and the producer's credit of the film, Lauren Mays was one of the main producers and Evan Ostrowski, all three of them were like, no, like, yeah. no, like we would rather find the money somewhere else because they already had Jordan and Serena Vincent and like they had a cat, we had a cast. Yeah. And um, so they, but they didn't tell any of us this. So right. we didn't really know how dire uh, things were 
until SAG started calling us and being uh -huh. like, they haven't put their deposit in. You guys might not get paid for this movie. And that was the night before filming. So oh. we had been on, we had been rehearsing for a week at that point. Yeah. Just falling in love with each other, falling in love with the project. And um, apparently we found out later the director of photography was buying film stock on his own credit card and just hoping that the film could pay him back. Right. And Eli was like going from rehearsals with us to like frantically calling his parents friends and being like, could you put some money into this film? Yeah. Which is the worst. I mean, oh, like you never yes. want to put your own money. Nightmare or your, scenario. And it worked out in that everyone made money on Cabin sure. Fever. I wish I had invested yeah. I, beyond just <laughs> not acting if I had put money into them because it did very well for an independent film. It's kind of, you know, it's it, the dream of every independent film is that you make a movie without any strings attached, no studio, you take it to a film festival and you start a bidding war. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what happened. Yeah. It, it premiered at Toronto and within six minutes of the first screening, people were making offers on it. And I, yeah, I think s like six different companies made made big offers and uh, yeah. Lionsgate ended up buying it. And at yeah. that time, Lionsgate was still kind of a fledgling company. Oh, sure, yeah. No, it was before Saw. Saw it. was like the next big mm -hmm. success for them. And that sort of established their brand as the horror film, you yeah. know, and comedy people, you know. Yeah, and yeah. you've done you've done some more uh, other than just Cabin Fever. You've had a couple of uh, ventures into the horror genre. Yeah, well, what happens, like we were saying earlier, is that yeah. if you do one role, then they start yeah. seeing you as that thing. And so there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of young horror filmmakers, I think, um, who saw me in Cabin Fever, and it was like, oh, you are, you know, I can plug you into my horror film, and it gets the Cabin Fever audience to pay attention. That's just sort of the the and and yeah and and some of them were were better than others you know like i i'm actually very proud of this uh film called borderland um, that was one of the questions that Lizzie at Apollo Europa said, what was the most challenging part of doing the movie Borderland? Yeah, Borderland was a crazy film. That was, and that was um, based on a true story about a, um, a couple of kids who got uh, kidnapped, or one kid got kidnapped. There were three guys and they were in Mexico and one of them got kidnapped and uh, killed by mm. a uh, cult. And oh, so there was, and, they, and then they eventually led to an investigation where they found that this cult had been, um, they had killed like over 30 people, buried their body. Yeah, it's one of these like, ugh. And so uh, Zev Berman is the writer director and he had uh, decided to make a contemporary version of this true story which happened in the, the 70s. Uh, so it's a very disturbing film. It was, it was it being shot right at the same time that Eli was making Hostel. And it, they were sort of parallel films. Hostel obviously did much better in terms of publicity and uh, you know getting a, a mainstream release. Mm -hmm. Borderland, um, by the time we were finished, kind of got shelved, and it's too bad because in retrospect, it's actually a, a pretty interesting film. Sean uh, Sean Austin's in it, and he he plays my torturer. It's a very like big departure oh, role wow. for him, and he's really good. And it was really fun to work with him because you know I grew up with Goonies and so everything that, like everybody that, else. That time Rudy made Sean Hunter. Exactly. Exactly. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and they like they like, scalp me at one point, and like it's a vicious, and it was a, a tough film. Like Oof. I'm I'm like stripped down to my underwear and chained up to a, uh, in a barn for a huge portion of the film, uh, being sort of psychologically tortured by Sean Austin, and that was. I mean, it's miserable in some ways, yeah. but uh, really fun. And the other, it was like, you know, a, a really gritty, interesting film set. We were in Tijuana shooting for months. Um, yeah, and Zev, um, Zev ha had a real vision. Um, and the DP is the same DP from Cabin Fever, this guy named Scott Kivon, who's an amazing director of photography. So the film looks really good. Uh, but you know, like I said, you know, some films don't find their audience, and that's one that unfortunately kind of went missed. Uh, so yeah, there were there were a lot of horror films. <laughs> there was that period of my life sure. where, was, you know, but that was also part of the exhaustion that I started to feel of like, okay, I spent three months in Tijuana shooting this movie, and you know, yeah. got tortured and you know committed emotionally. Um, there's all these scenes that are just you know, it's not super fun to play these scenes uh, yeah. all the time. No, and, it can take a lot out of you. Yes, it was exhausting, and when those films don't make any money or get much attention it can be like god what am i doing this for sure. you know and i think that you're doing it for the convention circuit my friend yes right have you uh ventured onto the uh, i'm going to circuit? this year actually because it's something that will Friedell has been doing <laughs> and i've done you know i've gone to conventions not as like an official like right. guest just to go like right. uh, i brought uh, some of my short films um 
I, I've brought to like Dragon Con and Comic Con, and those have been fun. But you know, now I'm, I'm going to be doing the uh, Calgary um, Expo mm -hmm. uh, this year, and um, yeah, I think we I might do it. Might be a Boy Meets World thing. I'm not going to get. Uh -oh. It might be a whole like little reunion going on because oh I know boy. Will's involved, and I might. I mean, I'm there, um, and we might get some more cast. Count so. me in. Yeah. I'll be first in line right. for the <laughs> autographs. Um, Let's see, we covered that, we covered that. Uh, ooh, I'm gonna save that one for last. That's a really good question and something I do wanna talk about, which is literary disco. Oh, yes, yes. yes. My podcast, you which is not on fancy. camera. Yeah, that was just a hobby thing that has now reached 100 episodes. 100 which episodes, is crazy. yes, congratulations. Yeah, it's, um, so I went to, uh, not only did I go to regular undergraduate, but I also went to grad school um, for fiction and literature. And while I was there, I became friends with two writers and thinkers, um, and Todd Goldberg and Julia Pistel. And we just had like the best conversations about books. And I think part of moving back to LA from New York City was realizing that LA is not a big reading town. Like mm -mm. people don't read much. If they do, they don't talk about reading that much. No, I just in read New York, scripts. Right, exactly. In New York, it's much more like, I, you know, there's a literary culture, just people, your average like dinner party, sure. it revolves around what you're reading. Sure. In Los Angeles, it revolves around what you're watching, you know, which is understandable. It's, it's the industry and it's what we do. But uh, I started realizing there was a, a, a hole in my life uh, for books. And so creating Literary Disco was mostly just like, hey, I want to get together and have those conversations we used to have while we were in grad school together with Todd and Julia. And um, putting it out there in the world, we realized that a lot of people feel this way. Um, yeah. You know, not just in Los Angeles, but around the world. People, one of, you know, fellow book nerds need to unite. It's hard to find people. And and the, the what we realized is like, you know, KCR, uh, KCRW has like a podcast, uh, has a, a book um, show called Bookworm. Um, and there's a lot of interview shows out there where they interview authors and they discuss books. and. Uh, frankly, they're pretentious. Like they're mm -hmm. just they're you know they, they they look for one type of book you know literary fiction. They don't read romance novels. They don't read horror book. They don't read Sweet Valley High. They don't read things that people are actually reading. Like what sure. are people actually reading? And so we you know even though we're snobs in our own right, we wanted to read everything. We wanted to be omnivores. And so the whole point of the podcast was to just read everything and discuss it from whatever angle happens between the three of us. And it's resulted in some. Pretty interesting. I would say the Sweet Valley High episode was one of our breakthroughs. We realized that people really like it when we read horrible books. Um, <laughs> and Sweet, make no mistake, Sweet Valley High is horrible. Oh, I'm sure it, it is. It, it's it, horrible in so many ways. Like yeah. just it not it, like it's a little ethically questionable. Uh, and then you know, Flowers in the Attic was a great episode because we realized how fucked up that book is. Yeah. Um, and uh, but then like Nancy Drew holds up pretty well. Oh, yeah. You, you got the whole Nancy Drew collection, right, Jamal? Oh. <laughs> I was reading like the Berenstein Bears. I don't know. Berenstein like Bears. Stain bears. <laughs> Whatever. I said Stain. I saw you tweeted about that recently. I, I tweet about it all the time. That is one of those mind-numbing things. You're yeah, like, the Mandela this effect. Is so weird. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so uh, we, we actually took a big break and I think we're gonna revamp the podcast uh, soon because we, we, you know, we've always been a little lazy about it. It's not as, as uh, nice of a production as you guys have oh, going please. here. Uh, but. Yeah, check it out. If you like reading, um, uh, give it a listen. Uh, it's, um, I, I, I listened to a little bit of it, and it is... I imagine if I were a smarter, more culturally aware person, I would love it. <laughs> so if you are a smart, culturally aware person who enjoys reading, check out Literary Disco. Yeah, please. And to that end, here is the question I'm going to ask. Uh, and it comes from... Oh, boy, I lost it. No, it's a good one, so I need to find it. Uh, John Bo Bobron? Ah, fuck it. At Keep Skip Rose. Keep Skip Rose. There it is. Cool. He says, what book would you like to see turned into a movie and why? Wow. So I figure a guy like you who uh, enjoys reading, yeah. you might have a better answer to this than me. Um, well, give the... It just uh, the the most recent episode of Literary Disco, I talked about this book that I, I read a couple months ago um, that blew me away. Um, it's called Kindred, mm. and it is a novel written by an author who I had never heard of until 
about eight months ago uh, named Octavia Butler. Okay. Um, and she was a science fiction writer, a black woman science fiction writer, which is very rare, and was especially rare when she was writing in the 60s and 70s. And her work is amazing. Mm. And she finds a way to write about social issues uh, with very uh, high concept plots and interesting ways and so she like the first book I read is called Dawn we read it on the podcast and um, it's an alien invasion story but um, ends up having a very interesting relationship to the history of slavery um, oh. without ever having to reference slavery yeah. Kindred does reference slavery directly and the reason I think it's an, it's an important book to read right now and would make an incredible film actually it would make an incredible miniseries uh, Oprah should produce it um, it's about a woman in 1976 uh, which is not a coincidence of course it's the bicentennial of the nation um, is uh, a black woman she's in her 20s and she starts feeling nauseous in the middle of the day moving into an apartment with her husband and uh, suddenly wakes up in uh, the antebellum south as a slave Ooh. and she has no control over this and she keeps getting yanked back uh, it turns out she's sort of a guardian angel figure from the future sent back to save this little white boy who eventually she realizes is her great 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 grandfather mm. so she has to keep in order to keep herself alive in the f present she has to keep this horrific racist slave owning white man alive in the past which is such an amazing extended metaphor for the history of the united states and our relationship to our own past and how we can't ignore it we have to contend with it in very real ways. We can't just say, well, slavery's over, done with that, black people, get over it, move on. It's obviously still an issue. Racism is still pervading our daily existence. And this book makes that, you know, it has this high concept, you know, I, I don't want to say fun, but it's, it's, it's a fun plot, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like a time traveling, which I love time travel stuff to oh, begin sure. with, but it has these ramifications without having to talk about it. It's not theoretical. It's not like, here's a discussion about why, you know, it's a fun story. It's an, an, an engrossing story. It's an enthralling story. And yet um, uh, it touches on things that I think we, 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 we tend to think of, of slavery in abstract terms. And when, it's her body, the main character's physical body, going back and getting whipped and coming back to the present. Uh, she's getting yanked back and forth without any control over it. And when she comes back to the present, she still has to heal physically. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, it's something I read um, Tana Hasi Coates' book, Between the World, uh, uh, Between the World and Me. I'm pretty sure that's the, it's his book. It's I couldn't help you. If it's I an amazing. Know. It's an amazing uh, series of. Uh, uh, letters that he's writing to his son about being black in America. It mm -hmm. came out last year, I think, uh, or maybe the year before. It's brilliant. And he um, he talked to the beginning of the book is about how the black experience is so much based on the body. And we tend to forget that, that, uh, that enslavement and physical um, degradation to the black body is the definition of America's racism. And it's a very weird, like, way to think about it but it takes it it removes it from the theoretical and makes it very visceral and that's what this story does and so I think it would be an amazing film somebody's got to make it I'm probably not the guy I don't think a, right. a white male needs to step in and, yeah. and adapt a, yet another story but somebody needs to make this as a miniseries like I've you're saying Oprah Lee Daniels yeah. on speed there you go I'll... somebody should do this because uh, it's a brilliant story well that is a fantastic answer and I certainly hope you enjoyed that uh, keep skip rose <laughs> There, boom. Uh, well, I I love that um, that you were, were thinking about it so much, and and that uh, leads me to the the thing I really do want to talk to you about, which is that you and Shiloh now have made this wonderful transition yeah. into the writing directing, which we've talked about here and there throughout. Yeah. Uh, Irish Twins was your first uh, short film, yep. which again people should go check out online for two dollars, and then. Um, Dungeon Master yes. really took you guys to a different level, level there. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, I remember 
I feel like you, I'd run into you right when you were finishing that, right yeah. when it was, or maybe about to go online. Yeah. And I saw that online, and I feel like I texted you or emailed you or called you just to rave about what a great yeah. fucking thanks, man. Short yeah. that was, thanks. and that is also available online. Yeah. Two dollars. iTunes. Um, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about Dungeon? Yeah, that was based on a real experience. We had had, um, you know, Shiloh and I were big geeks growing up, and we had played Dungeons and Dragons, which now I think is okay to talk about, but totally. in 2010-ish, when we were, it was still kind of like, mm -hmm. geek culture is like, and uh, we were at a party, uh, and we found somebody else who also admitted to playing D&D, &D, and we were like, wait a minute, we haven't played D&D &D since we were kids. Like, let's try this again now that we're, you know, late 20s, early 30s, let's do this. We can do that, right? It's cool. Mm -hmm. And we decided to play a game, and none of us could remember the rules, so we had to invite somebody who actually knew how to play. And this guy showed up, and um, he was the real deal. Like, a real, yeah. like, just died in the wool nerd. And he was super nice. Super socially awkward, yep, but great, and we had a great time. We ended up playing a whole campaign and having fun. But when he left, Shiloh and I looked at each other, and we were like, "Why? Why is there this thing? Why do we want to make fun of people that are socially awkward? Why do we want to make fun of geeks and nerds?" And we realized, like, "Oh, it's because we're insecure ourselves. Like we're we're so worried about like how people perceive us that we want to be like the cool kids who don't do D." And we were like that's fucked up, man, yeah. and we need to investigate this. And so we decided to make a short film that sort of turned that on its head and mm -hmm. where it's like, you're sort of, you're rooting for your main characters as like the cool kids. And so it was basically a revenge of the nerds with a little bit of magic thrown in. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a fun magical twist at the end of the short film. Yeah. And we didn't, you know, we thought it would be like this, we made it for no money, we begged friends and lots of favors. We did end up doing some like major makeup effects yeah, and there, getting there some, some very big effects. Yeah, there's some big stuff and uh, it struck a chord. Like it actually, it got a lot of attention. We won an award at Tribeca Film Festival and it got us our agents and like sort of really got the ball rolling as filmmakers and um, and we're, yeah, we're really proud of it. Like it seems a little dated now, of course, like everything, mm -hmm. but yeah, that sort of launched us in the writing and directing thing. And yeah. you know, based on that, we we've done, We've sold scripts, we've, you know, but we still haven't made a feature film. Well, and, wait a minute, what yeah. about Micah the Asshole Ghost? Well, that was our pilot, yeah. That was, <laughs> that's what oh, it's just a pilot. Said, according yeah. to the internet, it was a feature length. No, no, 22 minute internet. pilot. How dare you lie to me? Yeah, no, that was a pilot we did for Hazy Mills, which is Sean Hayes' company. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, originally it was going to be an online situation, mm -hmm. but once we started writing it and working and developing it, it was like, well, maybe we can actually sell this and so they financed the whole thing and we got to go shoot a whole pilot on our own again very little money but we're so proud of it i wish we could put it online right. it's now in the sort of netherland where this company paid for it and they're waiting to see if this company will buy it and that probably is never going to happen mm. and again it's already dated so yeah. it might not ever see the light of day until uh, maybe the dvd extras on our first feature or something okay. we'll be able to put out but we're very proud of it and because of that job you know it's this is the way hollywood works which people don't realize is like for every job that you do that doesn't reach the public, you get like, even if it could be a huge success in, in the sense that even though Micah never made it out there, we got multiple jobs because of it, because we were able to play that pilot for, right. So, you know, since then we've sold the show to Amazon. We've written a, a film for Lionsgate, neither of which have seen the light of day either. Well, still might, but you know, this yeah. is the game. It's like. Right, and then those jobs right. lead to other jobs. Right. Uh, but the directing, so you and Shiloh, you guys are a pair. You yep. do not, no, there's no separate projects. Nope. Um, and so I, I remember having read that you guys were gonna be directing uh, some of the Girl Meets World stuff. Yeah. And you did 18 of them. Yeah, yeah. That is a lot of episodes. It was so much fun, man. It was so, yeah, and it was, it was just a perfect fit. You know, yeah. like, the, I think the idea was, um, you know, they wanted me to come back and act on the show, and I said I wouldn't do it unless they let me direct, and, and let me and Shiloh direct. What I right. figured. Right, and, but you know, that usually means an episode. Um, yeah. And what happened is it just clicked. Like, we really got along with the cast, and I think that relationship in particular, like, because, you know, television, especially multi-camera television, it's, as a director, you don't really put your stamp on it visually. It's mm -hmm. not like, 
you're not going to be able to pick out like, oh, Joel Zwick decorated, directed that episode of, you know, it's, it's yeah. just not, that's not the point. The point is the actors, the performances. Yeah. That's where a director really is necessary. Um, so it's not a visual thing. It's much more of a, 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 an acting thing. And um, I think, you know, Shiloh and I having been actors, especially having been actors in their particular situation, mm -hmm. and in my case, exactly their situation with the same writing staff, they even had the same studio teacher that I did on Boy Meets World. Oh right? my God. So there was this instant rapport. And um, honestly, like, that's the only reason I wanted to, to do it and stick with it was because I loved those kids so much. I still do. And the connection that we had and like the ability to um, help them grow and just be there for them as artists in a way that, you know, I, I had adults be there for me when I was in exactly their position to be able to give back in that way was so satisfying um, so even when you know there were other creative limitations that were frustrating you're shooting for Disney Channel you know yeah. it's like there, you uh, schedule a budget thing whatever it was it was always worth it because um, the kids were so great and and watching them grow and change as artists yeah and 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 I, I it was it was a mutual thing because they kept asking us back and so we did yeah we did 18 episodes yeah, yeah. And that's uh, and I'm and bummed that, it's not going anymore because that would have been really fun. I think, uh, mm. I mean, from what I know about the Disney Channel, their mo is three seasons and out. Yeah, they've sometimes done a fourth. Yeah, and I think that's what we were all kind of like. Okay. Well, we're your number one rated show, and we've been nominated for two Emmys. We should get a fourth season. Um, yeah. yeah, but uh, you know they're, they they have this business model there. Yes, and, and at the it, end of the day, it's all about the right. dollars and the cents. It's all about the dollars and the cents, and it's interesting. Like it's something I didn't think about. Disney really, um, you know, they have an age range that they're aiming for, and you 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 age out of it pretty quickly. You know, you don't. I think like once you're over the age of thirteen. Are you watching the Disney Channel that much? Are you telling your friends you watch the Disney Channel that much? Yeah. Like, so I think they want. So even if like ten year old started watching Girl Meets World, they're thirteen now. Like mm -hmm. they and they really wanted the Boy Meets World audience to kind of tune in. And I think that happened to a certain extent. Yeah, but I, not in the way that they wanted it to. No, but I would say like if you were fourteen ish when yeah. you were watching like the first few seasons of, of Boy Meets World, theoretically, right. you could have your own children old yes. enough now to appreciate And I think that world. does happen. But even in those cases, an interesting about what's interesting about Disney Channel is, is, is parents don't really watch with their kids that much. Right. They mostly turn on Disney Channel and walk out of the room. Yeah. What parents watch with their kids is what the parents want to watch. Breaking Bad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Do not watch Breaking Bad with your children, you <laughs> monsters. It's true, though. Like, they actually have those numbers. Like, parents choose to watch Walking Dead, and their kids get stuck watching it with yeah. them. It's kind of disturbing. Yeah. Uh, but no, yeah, parents decide what they watch. And they, you know, that's kind of the argument for a, sh uh, a network like ABC, like, I don't know why they don't do TGIF style shows anymore. You know, I mean, there must be a bottom line number yeah. business sensey reason that I don't get, but it's a bummer because like that lineup, or at least that type of show that wasn't just a kid's show, it was a no, family show. It was. That doesn't exist anymore. It seems like there's kid's shows, yeah. and, and I guess this is true of every demographic, right? Like, whatever your demographic, if you're a woman in your late 30s, there's a there's a whole network just for you, right? Sure. There's, there's O, or, <laughs> right, Oxygen? What's the network? Oxygen. Or, okay, there's like, the there's network. networks that are built, Lifetime. You yep. know, there's networks that are like sort of tailor-made for whatever your, your, your type is or your taste is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where Netflix is doing really well, is that they're able to produce all types of shows for all niches. And, um, mm -hmm. and I think something like Fuller House probably is going to have a longer shelf life because Netflix does it all. So they'll, they, you know, and that's, that's the bummer is that Girl Meets World was sort of early on the reunion sequel show bandwagon. Yeah. We were one of the first three, three years ago, four years ago when we started, when they had first announced it. And uh, so it was on Disney Channel, which has this model they don't do more than three or four yeah that is that is definitely a bummer but i mean you think about all the shows i don't know one comes to mind that people always say oh it ended too soon i wish we could have more mm -hmm. and of the shows that are even in that conversation the ones where you get to revisit it that list is so small yes and uh and so i i, I definitely i didn't watch the whole series but i watched plenty of episodes yep. just to sort of relive the nostalgia yep. and everything and I thought you guys did a really great job Thanks, there man. and certainly you and Shiloh should be really proud Thanks, of getting to come back and and not only you know recreating the character but also putting a an adult touch on it yeah uh, 
which I don't know. I like that it kind of came full circle to that. It, it was. It's like a wonderful. I mean, just personally, it was like a wonderful journey. It was like yeah, coming back to your childhood in the best possible way, and like I said, giving back to it. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of having a conversation with it. Yeah. It's like, what did I wish somebody had said to me? Yep. You know, and I was like, I was I was able to say that to these kids. Like, That's you know, great. we had one day like where I mean, the kids were so good. They were so on top of their. They're so mature, and like, the their you know their social media world like presence Ugh. makes their job so much harder than like what being an actor when I was thirteen mm -hmm. was like. And they're so cool with it. They're all fine. Like they're all super healthy and like happy and like great families. And um, so I, I was in awe of them. And there wasn't really much to say. And, and we would do these. Um, we, we would be ahead of the curve often. Like they're, they were so on the ball and so professional. We would have a whole day to just mess around like a rehearsal where we didn't have anything to do. <laughs> so we would just like talk about acting. We'd kind of like play theater games. Like we'd start running charades and like and just to like be able to do that. Because like when I was a kid, I remember like on Boy Meets World, oftentimes they'd just be like, "We don't need to do a rehearsal; just take the day off." And Shiloh and I were like, "No, we got you here. Let's talk about <laughs> acting. What kind of actors do you guys want to be?" Because that's what I wish somebody had asked me. Sure. You know, like I had never had that conversation. Like I didn't understand what acting meant until I was thirty. Really, like I didn't know what it meant to be an actor. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, starting to ask them the questions of like, "What do you think acting is?" Like that was a really satisfying conversation to have. Um, hopefully, they feel likewise. But for me, it was just great to hear their responses. This is fantastic. Yeah. I hope there's some behind the scenes footage because otherwise you're gonna just be telling that story on your giant yeah. mall tour again Except and again and again <laughs> next year. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I cannot thank you enough. Yeah, thanks for having uh, me. For right. sitting and, and, and chatting with me today. Uh, can people go to Strong Brothers Magic Show? Uh, that, that still works, but actually just strong-bros.com. Strong-bros. Strong yeah. Uh, dot com to to find out what is up next for you guys. Yeah. Um, I know I threatened you at the start of this that oh, I can't right. let you out of here until you give me a Larry King game. I will oh, go over the God. rules with you again. Bad Larry King. I don't want a good one. I don't know what that means. That's fine. Okay. You, it means any voice that comes out of your head that doesn't sound like actual Larry King is going to be correct. Okay. And then you're going to give me that Larry TMI moment. Something he probably shouldn't say out loud in front of a live camera. <laughs> and then at the end of it, it can be anything. It can be literally anything. Okay. About a bowel movement. Yeah, anything great, you want. Great. And then uh, and then you throw to the phones, and if the city name that you throw to happens to be funny sounding, it's not going to hurt. So if you want to think about it for a second, I'm, I'll let you do that. I have a few goodbyes and thank yous. You do your goodbyes. All right, I'm going to send my goodbyes and my thank yous. Um, goodbye and thank you to everyone, uh, starting with all the wonderful people here in the studio, of course. Uh, the wonderful, as always, Jamie Foxx. Thank you so much uh, for monitoring the chat room. I'm glad they, nobody's heads exploded today. Okay, great. They're very pleasant. Oh, good. Well, thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Uh, of course, to uh, Dr. Kenny Chen, making sure that things run and sound smoothly. Uh, Jason McIntyre and Mike Duman up in the crow's nest, making sure that things broadcast smoothly. Uh, Sonia Cabrera, making us look so beautiful and lovely and not shiny today. And of course, uh, chat show himself, Mr. Kevin Pollack. Thank you for having a chat show that I may sit here in your stead. Uh, please come back safe from the hostage situation that I'm pretty sure you're involved in. Uh, I guess Jay Moore will be here next Sunday, so look for that. I'm, I'm probably going to watch it myself from afar. Thanks to the weirdos over at Westside Comedy Theater <laughs> for letting us have our little show here. But mostly, thank you, Barack Obama. <laughs> For eight years, you gave us hope, and you gave us change, and uh, oh man, are we going to need to relive how great these eight years have been over the next couple months. I'm going to say months is mm. all it's going to take to get that resignation slash impeachment, but we'll save God, that for so. another show, another time. <laughs> That is it, my friend. I can delay no longer for you. I got nothing. You have to give me something. <laughs> All right. Uh, so how, what do I do as Larry King? I anything, just say hey, uh, anything you want. Uh, and throw to the phones. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, do I talk to camera? Is that right what he does? Right, okay. Right uh, this is Larry King. I'm a huge Girl Meets World fan. <laughs> That's a phones, too much TMI. Philly, you're on the line. There it is. 
that's how you play the Larry King game. <laughs> it would not surprise me one bit to find out that Larry King is a Girl Meets World fan. It's a fan. little creepy. A little no, creepy. no, no, no. <laughs> it's, you know what it is? Because he has a bunch of 11-year-olds at home. Oh, okay. Because he never stopped fucking. Okay. <laughs> that's how you do it. Uh, that's it. I've already said my thank yous and goodbyes. So until next time, and as always, fuck off.